morning. I listen to you guys. You're all on fire, and I'm the only one that's not this morning. I don't know what's going on here. But hopefully this will change as we go through the Word of God this morning. I've been thinking about this for a couple of weeks now. I told you last week that we're not going to start a new book uh, until January after the first of the year. So I wanted to fill a few weeks with just kind of things that are helpful for us, practical, um, certainly uh, edifying, uh, especially as we go through this kind of time that we're going through. We know what a struggle it is to get together uh, with family members. I mean, everyone here can testify that there's some tension either way. Hey, I praise you if everything is good in your family dynamics and there's never any uh, controversy or, or trouble. But for most of us, especially, uh, I just know this in my own life, um, when you start following Christ, when you start uh, surrendering to Christ, man, it begins to, to cause a little bit of strain. Hopefully your family all knows Christ, but sometimes that's just not possible. But even outside of that, I was thinking about this too, just the way and we deal uh, with the, the world outside right now during this time, right? Because there's all these markers sort of of Christianity, or as the world would say, markers of God, but, but none of those are defined. And the only way those are going to be defined is by us. And so we need to think about how we're going to approach approach the world. And, and it's not just in what we say. The gospel, right? The gospel is, is, is most assuredly um, what we say, but it's also how we live. And so how we live becomes important, how we approach the world. And so that's what I was thinking as I went to Luke 17. That's where we are this morning, if you want to turn there. Uh, and actually, we're going to do the whole chapter, verses 1 through 37. I know that sounds scary, but trust me, we're not going to get technical this morning because I want to hit on a few points that we just need to be reminded of as we go through this season things that we can definitely apply and hang on to. And it's not just for this season. This is the way we're supposed to live, right? But sometimes we forget, especially when things become uh, awkward or tense when we get involved. And you know, in this silly, crazy, nutty time we're in right now, uh, this becomes all more important. And so originally I was going to talk about thankfulness, right, this morning, right, and more or less in spirit of the holiday. But as I studied the wider context of this passage, I just kept getting drawn in to all of these things uh, that pop up in this, in this chapter. And I thought, man, so it's apparent that even though I wanted to talk about thankfulness, that then there's so many other things uh, in this chapter uh, that have to deal with, uh, especially with reference to our gratitude towards God. Thankfulness is just one of those aspects. And so this is really why I got into this, right? That there's just so much more about the Christian life uh, that conveys gratitude towards God than simply just verbalizing thankfulness. And so I wanted you to see this, right? That there are just other essentials in the Christian life that demonstrate gratitude and thankfulness towards God long before we could ever begin to express this in words. And that really is what becomes important because your gospel message, right, is going to, is going to match uh, the way that you walk, the way that you express it in your life. Uh, just by way of example in this chapter, if you look down, right, this Samaritan man, just kind of in, in, in general, uh, this Samaritan man, this, this leper that gets cleansed by Christ in our story today, he not only gives thanks, but he also fell down uh, at the feet of Christ and he was praising him in a loud voice. And so we see right from the beginning uh, that there is just more to this thankfulness than just merely expressing it uh, in words. I mean, in the world, we hear people give thanks to God all the time. I hear it constantly. It's just like your ears are tuned to it, right? Thank God for my job. Thank God uh, for my dog. Thank God for my car. Thank God uh, for my children. Uh, and, but the problem with that is that thankfulness towards God is more than just words, right? Thankfulness towards God is an attitude and it's a lifestyle that, that displays the value of Christ to the world. Do you understand that? Right? It's not just saying these words, 
It's living this life that actually displays uh, the glory of God uh, to the world, right? The value that Christ uh, is in our life. It's a lifestyle that not only displays the glory and majesty of God in Christ, but it also is a lifestyle uh, that displays or displays Christ's worth, right? And the value to everyone around us. People should be able to see that Christ is valuable through the way that you live and speak. In other words, a thankfulness towards God should be helping everyone around us to see Christ for who he really is. That's the point. Okay? And that's really what we want to get to, right? This whole thing. Remember, we were created. We talk about this all the time. We were created. You were created to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That's the whole reason God created you, okay? It wasn't because God was lonely or that He needed anything, okay? He created you to glorify Him and enjoy Him forever. Uh, Remember Genesis 1.27, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him male and female he created them. And, but the problem is, as you know, is that the image of God in us was tainted uh, by sin. Right? It was darkened uh, by sin. Right? We know from Romans 1.21, uh, it says, right, this is the, 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 the problem with humanity. This is the problem uh, with our relationship with God. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, it says. But they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. We were made, right, for thanksgiving. That was the idea that I had. I actually stole that from a guy who had an article about that. I just love that. We were made for Thanksgiving. And it's true. You see it everywhere in the world. In fact, I was looking at a YouTube video. I didn't watch the video. (laughs) It said 10 things that you do that your dog loves. It had 5.1 million views. I thought, oh my gosh, this is the problem with the world. This is everything in a nutshell. The world cares more about what their dog thinks than what God thinks. And we see it everywhere we go. There's no honor, right? There, nobody cares. They, they honor God with their lips. Thank God for my job. Thank God I got out of that accident. Thank God uh, I, I, I don't have breast cancer anymore. But there's no honoring Him with their life. And so our thankfulness towards God becomes much more than just words. It must involve our character and our nature and our attitude towards the One who created us. That's the problem. Remember Romans 21? Romans 121, notice it says that they know God. Even though they know God, they do not honor Him or give Him thanks. And so it becomes imperative, right? Because we are supposed to reflect the character and nature of God. And this becomes more imperative uh, for those of us who have been redeemed by Christ. Because you were created. You were recreated. You are a new creation specifically uh, to reflect the glory of God to the world. Uh, You were created, right, uh, to reveal the character and nature of God to the world. They're supposed to see uh, Him for who He is through who you are. Why? Because the nature of God is in you. You have a divine nature. You have been called by Christ, saved by Christ. This is what God tells us in Isaiah. Look at this as we get started this morning. You guys know this verse. It's one of my favorites, right? This is what God says in Isaiah. I will say to the north, give them up. Give who up? The ones that belong to him. And to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name and whom I have created for my glory, whom I have formed, even whom I have made. And so this morning, we're not going to get real technical with this, but I just want to remind you that you were created for Thanksgiving and it is this, this, this one thing in your life that is going to convey to the rest of the world, right? Uh, the beauty and the, and the majesty of Christ himself. But let me pray this morning and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, we come before you and admittedly, uh, we get caught up in these things, Lord. I know, um, 
We don't always give thanks and we don't always remember all of the good things, Father God. We dwell on so many of the bad things that we forget that you are good and that everything that comes down from heaven is good and that everything uh, that comes from Christ is good and everything that comes through salvation, your word, uh, your eternity, all of these things are good. And so, Lord, we want to remember that this morning. But even more importantly, Father God, we want to remember why and how and, and, and when we're re- representing you in everything that we do and that that people might see this lord that they might follow you that they might worship you it's not about uh, something that we might gain from the world father god but that whole um gospel message would be made clear father that you might draw uh the unsaved the lost the unbelieving world to yourself Uh, through our words and through our life. And so, Lord, help us this morning to be listeners, honestly, um, to see it as the Word of God and not the Word of men, Father God, to know that uh, You have laid down these things for us because You are more than gracious and merciful to us. The fact that You would even call us to participate in this to begin with is is amazing in and of itself. And so this morning we pray always for the preaching and the hearing this morning, Father God, that we might honor you and lift you up, that we might exalt you in everything that we do, Father. Uh, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So the bigger context, we've got to get into that a little bit, right? Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Uh, this is the last days of his ministry. In fact, uh, in between verses 10 and 11 in this chapter, uh, most Bible guys, big brain theologians believe that the events of John 11 happened during this time. Uh, if you don't know what John 11 is, that's when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And so this was the final straw for all the religious leaders, right? Uh, they Who wanted to kill Jesus. So Jesus Jesus knew that his time was limited. And so his whole purpose in this chapter was to prepare his disciples to carry on the ministry after he was gone. And so he's talking about these things uh, that are imperative, right? The things that are really important. That's kind of how it goes. If you look down at verse 22 and it says, and Jesus said to his disciples, he says, the days will come when you will uh, long to see the uh, see one of the days of the son of man and you will not see it and then verse 25 he says but first the son of man must suffer uh, many things and be rejected by this generation and so the lessons here in Luke 17 are these things that really matter three years of ministry with Christ right and these disciples have been learning and following and and sharing and all these things that they've done with them and Jesus is getting into this point where he wants them to understand look here's the things that are really going to matter Here's the things that I want you to focus on. And it's not just these four things, of course, but in this chapter, it's specifically four things. These things that are essential uh, for the Christian life. But also it's a good reminder for us, like I said, as we enter the holidays, uh, when we have this opportunity, right, to display the character and nature of Christ. I know if you're like me... I seem to blow it every year, right? Because I have a large amount of unbelieving family in my life. And it seems like, even though I'm a pastor, it would seem normal, right? I go into a a crowd of 15 relatives and I should just be able to light up the room. But that's not the way it works, okay? I am as, as, as quiet as you are. And that's kind of the point. It's not so much what we say or do. It's, it's really about what we don't say and what we don't do. Right? And so I know what it is to be hindered in that. It's not a very glorious thing, right? And so what I was thinking about is how do we express our thankfulness towards God in a way that makes God look glorious to the world, right? How do we reflect this image of Christ to the world? And this is where we're going in this chapter. And so we're not going to go into every single detail of this chapter, but I want to point out four things that I want you to remember this morning, right? That are very practical that you, it's not, I'm preaching to the choir here. This is nothing revolutionary, okay? You've heard it a million times, but I want to remind you of what you need to think about when you're in those moments, because those are the things that I have to do. I have to think, oh my gosh, what am I doing? This is who I am, right? And so this is what I want you to see in this chapter, right? This is what I want you to look at. First, look at verse three with us. 
the first thing that we need to remember, right? The first way that we display gratitude towards God uh, is the way that we forgive others, okay? The way that we forgive others. We forget about forgiveness. This is one of the biggest things, right? And so why do we do this? Because Christ forgave us. Look at verse 3. Jesus says, be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, right, forgive him. And I love this, be on your guard. And the whole context of this is Jesus just said, hey, be careful about being a stumbling block to everyone else. But more importantly, if someone stumbles against you, be careful right? Be on your guard that you don't get into sinning uh, because they've stumbled against you. That's the whole point. He says, be on your guard, right? Be careful about sinning yourselves when someone sins against you. And so this goes against our just our natural bent. And I see this. I mean, a major portion of my counseling has to do with forgiveness, because it's not our natural bent to forgive, right? Our natural bent is to what? We want justice, We want justice. We've been wrong. We've been hurt. And so we want to be satisfied, right? We want, we want to be, uh, we want some kind of, um, recompense for what's happened to us because we're victims or maybe we just even get the satisfaction about going and telling everybody else what happened right that's our form of revenge but that's not who we are right this is not the way that Christ forgives us That's the whole point. We forget about this forgiveness thing. When we fail our 4,000th time and we do, Christ doesn't abandon us. He doesn't kick us out the back door, right? He forgives us. He is constantly forgiving us. Almost everything you read in the New Testament talks about Him being an advocate for us, and that's in the present tense. He is always interceding for you. And so in this same way, we are forgiving others. Remember, we've been commanded to forgive others. We talked about this last week just briefly uh, from 1 John 5, remember? One of the evidences that you are a child of God, okay? One of the evidences that you are a child of God is that you love His commandments and His commandments are not burdensome. Okay? His commandments are not burdensome. Look at uh, Ephesians 4, right? Be kind to one another, tender hearted, right? Forgiving each other just as God in Christ has also forgiven you. Same thing in Colossians. We see this all the time. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Why do we put on a heart of compassion? Because this is the character of Christ in you. This is the nature of Him. These things should begin, right? When we begin to understand what forgiveness is, forgiveness does not become a burden. Do you understand that? This isn't, okay, listen to me here, because you need to know this. You need to think about this. Forgiveness isn't going to someone and saying, I'm sorry because you're commanded to. Do you understand? Okay. In fact, Paul defines that, right? In 1 Corinthians 13, he says, hey, look, love keeps a record of what? No wrongs. Okay. And so when we're talking about forgiveness, this becomes natural to us, even though we may push back against it. Oh my gosh, I can't believe they did that to me. Our natural reaction, our natural bent becomes to now, right? Go and reconcile these relationships. Go and seek forgiveness. And so he says, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility. Man, we forget that one. That meekness. That meekness that says, you know what? If there's anyone that doesn't deserve to be forgiven, it's me and not the person who's offended me. And so we're going to put on that that garment of humility. And you'll notice all of these attributes in this verse. It's 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 amazing. Because we talk about this all the time. Part of our Christian walk is not what we put off. Do you understand? Man, I hate Christianity that makes everything about putting off sin. There is that command to put off sin, but more importantly than that, we're to put on what? Christ. We're to put on the character and nature of Christ because that's going to be your greatest defense against sin. And so when all you talk about is what people aren't doing, right? You're forgetting the most important thing that we are putting on Christ. We are putting on His character, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, right? Bearing with one another. Very strong word. 
Bearing with one another isn't mean, doesn't mean to put up with one another. Do you understand that? It means literally that we're going to carry that person. You're going to carry your enemy. You are going to bear all of their burdens, right? Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so should you also forgive them. In fact, look at verse 4. And if your brother sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times a day saying, I repent, Jesus says, forgive him. And you know, we get caught up in that verse because we're just so corrupt. We're like, okay, well, I'll forgive him if he comes back and does what? Repent. Is that the way that Christ treats you? Right? He's constantly forgiven you. We forget that Christ died for our sins when? While we were yet sinners, right? He didn't die for us when we were good or when we started going to church or when we started making good decisions or reading the Bible. He forgave us while we were sinners. And so we're not waiting for somebody, right, to come and repent. We are forgiving them. That is our nature. That's how we respond uh, to the world. And really, this is what people are going to see. I think one of the greatest accusations by the world against Christianity is that we are hypocrites because we don't what? Forgive. See it all the time. Okay? See it all the time. Secondly, we display our gratitude towards Christ when we are faithful to fulfill our purpose. When we are faith, we show gratitude towards Christ when we are faithful to do the very thing that Christ has created us to do. And this is something that I've had a lot of conversations with uh, about with our young men over the years, right? Because it's the little things, right? It's being faithful with the little things. It's not being faithful with the difficult things or the impossible things. We get that, but it's being faithful with the little things. It's the mundane things, right? It's the everyday things uh, that honors and glorifies Christ. Look at verse 7. Jesus says, Which of you having a slave plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he comes Uh, in from the field, come immediately and sit down and eat. But will he not say to him, prepare something for me to eat and properly clothe yourself and serve me while I eat and drink and afterwards you may eat and drink. Uh, He does not think the he does not thank the slave because he did the things which he commanded, does he? So you too, when you do all things with which you are commanded, say, we are unworthy slaves. We have done only that which we ought to have done. And so that's kind of a confusing passage in a little bit, but essentially what Jesus is saying is he's saying, look, the servant in the field uh, is the servant in the home, is the servant everywhere. Uh, He does not uh, expect to be thanked by his master because he's only doing what he's been called to do. And the whole point is that Jesus just got done talking about faith the size of a mustard seed in the previous verses. He's saying, look, faith the size of a mustard seed, right? You can, you can uproot a mulberry tree and you can throw it into the sea. And so Jesus is saying, look, don't get caught up in all of that stuff. That's great things, but it's going to be those mundane things, right? It's going to be plowing the field. It's going to be shepherding the sheep. It's going to be cooking dinner uh, for your master. It's going to be those serving things that become most important. And the idea here is that we need to learn to be faithful with the little things. I think about this all the time. I used to complain about it a lot more, but since I quit football, I don't have to worry about it anymore. I used to marvel being a coach for 15 years. I'd see a team that was losing 50 to nothing. And if a dude made a tackle, the dude on the losing team made a tackle in the backfield, he would jump up and start dancing for like 10 minutes. You ever notice that? And I'm thinking, that's what you're getting paid a gazillion dollars to do is make tackles. What are you dancing around for? And so it's the same thing in our Christianity, right? God has called us to glorify Him in everything that we do. God has called us uh, to display the grace and mercy of Christ in everything that we do. Remember, it was Christ who was the servant of all. 
And the whole point is here that we need to learn to be faithful with these little things, right? If a common servant, this is the whole point Jesus is making. If a common servant is faithful uh, to obey the orders of his master who does not reward him and does not thank him, then how much more should we be uh, faithful to our master who rewards us graciously, who gives us everything problem with our world is everybody wants praise and, and self-recognition. We're, we're, we're drunk with it in this society. The goal in this life is not to get praise from the world. The goal in this life is to get praise from the master, right? One of my favorite verses, this is what we all want in this life. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with what? A few things. Jesus says, I'm going to put you in charge of many things. He says, enter into the joy of your master. Thirdly, we display our gratitude towards Christ when we come to him, right? When we keep coming to him. And we worship him for who he is, right? That's how we display gratitude to Christ when we keep coming to him, when we turn to him and we worship him for who he is. Look at our text. Look at verse 11. And it says, while Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered the village, 10 lepers, 10 leprous men who stood at a distance met him and they raised their voices saying, Jesus, master, have mercy on us. And when Jesus saw them, he said to them, go and show yourself to the priest. And as they were going, they were cleansed. It says, now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back glorifying God with a loud voice and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered and said, "Uh, were, were there not 10 cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And Jesus said to him, stand up and go for your faith has made you well. And so one thing that occurred to me when I was studying this passage, and I've studied it a few times, but one thing that occurred to me when I was studying this passage is how quick I was to criticize the other nine men who didn't come back and thank Jesus. That's the first thing that comes to our mind, right? But then I'm, rem- I'm thinking about it myself. I'm like, man, how many things has God given us? How much does God lavish us every day? I mean, I get blessing after blessing after blessing every single hour, every single moment, and I forget to thank God myself for all of those things. I mean, we're all the same, right? The fact that God made us, He surrounded us with so much good in this life that He lavishes us with His grace, that, he, that we know the love of God in this life, that we know forgiveness, that we know grace, that we know mercy, Uh, that we know the goodness and kindness of Christ and the fact that the only time that we say it out loud is when we're on this when we're in this building on Sunday mornings for one hour I think my gosh man how can we talk about the nine when that's you know I mean look at the verses look at verse 15 it says now one of them right the Samaritan guy he says when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back glorifying God with a loud voice. Man, Luke is just adamant about this. And why is it so important that he was glorifying God with a loud voice? Because everybody was watching. He was glorifying God with a loud voice and he fell down at his feet, it says. Giving thanks to, giving thanks to Jesus. I mean, don't you see it? Thankfulness is just more than words. It's more than just a prayer. It's our, it's our whole life. It's our whole attitude. It's our whole being, right? It's our whole mind, heart, and bodies that are sold out, right? Uh, to reveal uh, or to display the value of Christ to the world. This is what people will see. I've had people tell me over the years, and it's true. I've, I've heard this. I've heard from other testimonies. Uh, I, I, I've talked to people that I know that I had a former life with. They aren't believers. They don't trust God. They don't care about Christ. They don't care about any of this stuff. And I'll talk to them about it. Man, don't, you know, 
why don't you believe or why don't you ever think about eternity or why don't you ever think about Christ? You know, don't you believe that I believe Jesus? And you know what? It's funny. They tell me all the time, I believe that you believe. But Christ just isn't for me. And I'm thinking, that's just weird. But the point is, is that they, they believe me. Do you understand? Now I want them to get and believe Christ. But the point is, is that we live that life that displays the value of Christ to the world. And I think this plays right into the fourth way that we can display our gratitude towards Christ. Look at this. And this is this expectation, right? That we're always looking forward to and longing uh, for Christ's return. Looking forward to and longing for Christ's return. Now, I know that sounds kind of funny. But think about it in terms of this, that we are always prepared. Okay? We're always preparing or we're always prepared. That we are preparing for the day when we will see Him face to face. Look at verse 22. And Jesus said to His disciples, the days will come when you will long to see the one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. And they will say to you, look here or look there. Don't go away. He says, don't, do not go away and do not run after them for just like lightning, right? When it flashes out of one part of the sky and shines in another part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be on this day. And then down in verse 30, he says, it will be just the same on the day that the Son of Man is revealed. In other words, right? We're not supposed to be running around, right? Looking at prophecies, trying to figure out when Christ is going to come. We're supposed to be running around uh, looking for Christ and doing those things that God has called us to do. That's Jesus' whole point in this. You see, one of the evidences that you believe Christ is that you are honoring Christ is that you are eager for His return. We talk about this a lot. And believe me, it's a discussion. There's like three things that I can get into an argument about instantly about um, the deity of Christ. And one of those is that Christians are longing for waiting for, desiring Christ's return. And so why do we say that? Well, because the Bible says that, but more importantly, it is the thing that compels us to do the very thing that we're supposed to do. Look at this, 2 Timothy 4, eight. right? This is just one of the verses. He says, In the future there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, Paul says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but to all of those who have loved His appearing, right? And it is this expectation of Christ's return that compels us to be doing those things that Christ has called us to do. It's this eager expectation uh, that compels us to tell everyone about Christ, right? This is how we display gratitude and thankfulness towards Christ because we believe Him and we know there is coming a day of judgment. And when Christ returns, it'll be too late for the unbelieving world. Okay? There'll be no repentance on the day that Christ returns. And so this is the compassion and the love that we have for the world that we want to display these things of Christ to the world. In fact, I was reading in Titus I saw this this morning. I was just going through a couple of my verses. Paul says the same thing. I want you to listen to this. Because in this passage, Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, in this passage, basically Paul says the same thing that we've been talking about this morning, that there is thankfulness, right? That there is forgiveness, that there is an expectation of Christ's return. Listen to what he says. He says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. That's thankfulness, right? And that's a general statement from Paul. It doesn't mean that all men are going to be saved. What it means is that God has made salvation available to all men. Anyone who would fall down at the feet of Christ and trust in Him for who He is. Okay, there is the thankfulness. And he says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly and righteously and godly in the present age. What is that? That's our faithfulness, isn't it? We're going to be faithful because we're thankful for the salvation that God has brought to us. We're thankful that God has has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And so we're going to be faithful. Verse 13, he says, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of our Uh, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. What is that? That is the expectation, isn't it? We're thankful that Christ has brought salvation to us. That's going to cause us to be faithful. And we're going to be expecting the return of Christ because we love Him, right? We want to be with Him. We want to uh, serve out this eternity with Him. And then it says in verse 14, right? Right? Our great God and Savior Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. What is that? That is that is forgiveness, isn't it? That he has redeemed us, that he has redeemed us from every lawless deed, right? He has purified us. He has made us a people for his own possession that we might, right, do those things that he has called us to do, those things that glorify him, those things that reflect his character and nature to the world. One of my favorite verses in Matthew 24, look what it says. I'll leave you with this. Blessed is the slave whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Man, that is a bumper sticker and a door sign and any place else you can put it. Blessed, right? Blessed is the slave whom the master finds uh, so doing uh, when he comes, when there is forgiveness, faithfulness, thanksgiving, and this expectation of Christ's return. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, for your words this morning. I'm hoping, Lord, just that we have at least this cursory memory of these things, Father, when we're engaging uh, this holiday season, just thinking about man, forgiveness, and thinking about uh, this faithfulness towards the things of God, thinking about this expectation of Christ's return. That's really everything that this holiday is about, Father God, and thinking about uh, forgiveness with thanksgiving, Lord. Please rewire our thinking this year. Rewire our hearts Uh, in this season, not to be caught up with the things of the world, Lord, but to look to you. Instead of focusing on our troubles and focusing on the troubles of the world, Father, help us to focus on you. Help us like this uh, leprous man to um, praise you in a loud voice everywhere we go to fall down at your feet and to worship you. Please, Lord. You know that our, our spirit is willing, but our, our flesh is weak. And so, Lord, uh, we pray this morning uh, for this help, especially in this season, Father God. We pray for this kind of help. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for all these truths this morning. We pray this in your precious and wonderful name. Amen.